Hello, good afternoon, everyone. In a few minutes, we will be officially starting our webinar on uh, exploring women's role in food and agriculture resilience. This is organized by the School of Management and Office of Gender and Development of the University of the Philippines in Mindanao, with the support from the Australian Center for International Agricultural Research, ACR, and the University of New England, UNE. But before that, here are some um, important reminders. Please mute your microphone during the lecture and uh, participants have the option to use the Q&A portion of the program to raise their questions. We are also enjoining all the attendees to rename your Zoom login details to institution underscore your name. You may also post questions in the live stream via Facebook comment section. At this point, kindly stand for the Philippine National Anthem. Noon pa man, malaki na ang naging bahagi ng mga kababaihan sa lipunang Pilipino. Kaisa sila sa marugdob na paghahangad ng kalayaan ng ating lahi. Kabilang sila sa paglinang ng ating makulay na sining at mayamang kultura. Kasapi sila sa pagtataguyod ng mga adhikain ng kapwa mamamayan at sa pagtugon sa mga pangangailangan ng lipunan. Katuwang sila sa pagtukla sa mga larangan ng agham at medisina. Sa pagpapairal ng batas, karapatan at katarungan para sa lahat. Kabahagi sila sa paglilingkod sa bayan at sa pagpapanatili ng demokrasyang Pilipino. Sa paglipas ng panahon, hindi nagmaliw ang kanilang pag-ibig sa ating inang bayan. Mga kababayan, ito ang alay ng mga kababaihang Pilipino para sa bayan. Tumayo po tayong lahat at sabay-sabay natin awitin ang pambansang awit ng Pilipinas. Thank you, everyone. Now to, to formally welcome us is the UP Mindanao Chancellor, who also has numerous engagement in agricultural supply and value chain studies. Ladies and gentlemen, a warm virtual applause to UP Mindanao Chancellor Larry N. Digal. Mr. Geoffrey Keith, Capacity Building Manager and his team in ACR, or the Australian Center for International Agricultural Research in Canberra, Dumay Alagkan, Mara Failon, and Jing Damasa Gray from ACR Philippines, a resource speakers, Dr. Christy Chang from the University of New England, Ms. Jaya Manila and Luis Walda, Malumun Tiflor, our new GAD or Gender and Development Coordinator here in Mindanao. Luz Gomez, our Dean of the School of Management, students and colleagues from the School of Management and UP Mindanao, and other academic institutions, government, non-government organizations, private sector, friends, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Welcome to this webinar organized by the UP Mindanao School of Management and the Office of Gender and Development in partnership with ACR. For more than two decades, the UP Mindanao had been collaborating with ACR in its research undertakings. 
We started in the School of Management with a project in agribusiness supply chain headed by former Chancellor Dr. Silvia Concepcion in year 2000. Luis, Malu, and I had been part of this research, which trailblazed the supply chain and value chain themes in SOM. Most of the succeeding research were also ACR funded. I was part in two of those, which examined the competitiveness of several fruit and vegetable value chains. Aside from SOM, the College of Science and Mathematics here in UP Mindanao also had ACR projects from Professor Ruth Gamboa's Holoturia to Professor Emma Bayogan's Mango and her several post-harvest projects. In 2013, the College of Humanities and Social Science through Ms. Xiang Fuentes also had a project on agricultural extension in conflict areas. Aside from research, the partnership with ACR also extended to capacity building. We have six Jan Allwright Fellowship awardees for their master's and PhD degrees, three Jan Dillon Fellows, one Mary Williams Fellow, and majority of whom come from SOM are currently involved in several ACR projects. So we have, I would say, a strong partnership with ACR. And mine knows this, that we want to even strengthen this partnership and we hope to do more projects with ACR, whether in research or capacity building. This webinar is initiated by one of these ACR project teams in time for the National Women's Month celebration. The speakers will highlight the significance of inclusive policies for women in agriculture. This is the first of a series of webinars organized or co-organized by the UPMIN GAD office. The webinars aim to enhance the learning environment in the university. This is also part of the university's commitment to mainstream gender and development through research, instruction, extension, and public service. So let us take this opportunity to share and contribute to collegial interactions. We look forward to a fruitful and enriching discussion. Again, welcome and good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Chancellor Digal. At, at this point, we are going to hear about the ACR's capacity building. Um, this will be delivered by Mr. Geoffrey O'Keefe, Manager, Capacity Building, SCR Canberra. Geoff is the Australian Center for International Agricultural Development's Capacity Building Manager. In his role, Joe manages a range of fellowship training programs, as well as the alumni research support facility. Joff has been in this position for three years. Prior to this role, Joff worked for AusAid and DFAT and was posted to Papua New Guinea to manage a large governance program. Joff holds a master's from the Australian National University, economic policy, and has special interest in gender equality. He has co-authored published on how agricultural science can deploy more inclusive gender approaches. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Geoffrey O'Keefe. Thank you very much for that very warm introduction. And a special thank you to the Chancellor Larry de Gaulle. Um, very much appreciate you being here and, and thank you for the opportunity to join this webinar. Um, as you highlighted, Chancellor, the partnership between UP Mindanao and ACO goes back some years and is highly valued by both countries. Um, we see UP Mindanao as a key partner in delivering our joint priorities between Australia and the Philippines in agricultural research. Um, so as, as you highlighted, uh, Mitch, I'm uh, ACS Capacity Building Manager. So I manage a, a range of different um, capacity building and training programs, such as the Merrill Williams Fellowship, the John Dillon Fellowship, the John Allwright Fellowship, and the Alumni Research Support Facility. Um, so I was really pleased to see uh, this webinar being organised because, I mean, the Alumni Research Support Facility under which uh, this particular piece of research came from it was initially a COVID response program. Uh, so the aim of the, the program was to support researchers and research agency who may have had funding diverted due to changing priorities of government. So that was the kind of initial uh, idea behind the program. 
But then it started to evolve. So we also saw this opportunity to strengthen our relationships with key agencies and, and key uh, research organizations such as UP Mindanao, and also with our alumni and providing co-benefits, both to the alumni and their organization, but also back to Australia and the broader research community around knowledge on COVID responses and adaptation measures that are occurring so we can share that knowledge in the COVID and eventually, fingers crossed, post-COVID worlds. The program also, the Alumni Research Support Facility also coincided with an ACO-wide process of, I guess we call it naval, naval gazing in Australia, whereby we've been asking um, our own researchers to reimagine what ACIA could look like, both for the current global context, as well as the increasingly complex situation that agriculture and research finds itself in. A strong message from these kind of uh, strategic dialogues and processes has been that we need, as ACIA, we need to seek new perspectives and new ways of commissioning research that is led by those that understand the issues and the solutions best, those researchers who are on the ground. We're also very thankful to the University of New England, uh, particularly Professor John Gibson, who, uh, you know, we called up one day when we had this idea about the Alumni Research Support Facility and said, we want to stand up with this whole new global program and we want you to do it in a few weeks. And Professor Gibson kind of paused for a few moments and said, all right, why not? We can do it. And you know what? The University of New England have deployed some really excellent grant management processes, often holding my team to account as well as an excellent research mentoring and collaboration program of which um, Professor Christy Chang, who's also on the call, um, is a part. So the initial round of the Alumni Research Support Facility saw around 40 researchers uh, from, I think, around 12 countries receive funding from an incredibly diverse array of, of research areas related to COVID res responses. We have subsequently held a second and final round with a focus on Pacific and Mekong countries because there was a greater need for capacity building with those researchers to support them to, to achieve the standard um, of, the, of the researchers in round one. And uh, Mary Lou's research topic was of particular interest to ACR. So this is the, the, the research which we'll be discussing today as we're entering the final year of our own gender equity um, policy and strategy. So as we finalize the first of these, the, this is the first gender equity strategy that ACIA has. So as we come to the final year of this uh, strategy, we're looking to researchers from across the globe to help shape our approach to drive a new strategy um, around gender equity uh, within our research and within our own organization. One area uh, that we're currently thinking through is the issue of meaningful inclusion. So when we talk about gender and in a related manner, when we're talking about women's inclusion and women's economic empowerment, we're now challenging ourselves to think a bit further. Which women are we talking about and why? Are we including women in all their diversity? Are we, are we thinking about how communities of diverse sexual orientation and gender identity and expression are specifically excluded? Are we challenging our own norms around heteronormativity or cisnormativity in the design of our initiatives? And also, what, do the, what are the intersectional forces that further marginalize women in all their diversity? Are we being aware of these forces in, in our new approach uh, and, and in, in forming our, our next gender equity policy and strategy? So in conclusion, I would, I would like to thank, uh, thank the Chancellor very much. I'd like to thank UP Mindanao for the invitation and commend Marilu for taking such an important and timely research topic. Um, thank you very much. I look forward to the discussions. Thank you so much, Mr. Keith. And uh, please hold on to your questions. We will have uh, an open forum later on and uh, we shall be entertaining questions by then. So at this point, next in line is an overview of the Alumni Research Support Facility ARSF project. This will be given by Ms. Malu Montiflor Ms. Montiflor is a researcher from the School of Management since 1999. And as of January this year, Ms. Montiflor is the current coordinator of UP Mindanao's Gender and Development Office. Most of her work focused on rural Southern Philippines, especially issues relating to the smallholder farmers. 
She had been involved in several ASEAR projects since 2000 and was awarded the John Allwright Fellowship in 2006 and John Dillon Fellowship in 2013. She will provide an overview of the project enabling inclusive policies that enhance women's role in developing resilient food and agriculture systems in the Philippines. Ladies and gentlemen, Ms. Malu Montiflor. To our partners from Asia Philippines and Asia Canberra, to our colleagues from the School of Management and UP Mindanao, to the project team and to those who are attending via Zoom or watching via Facebook Live, good afternoon. We organized this webinar in celebration of the National Women's Month and as part of the 26th UP Mindanao anniversary. Our project is a small research project funded by the ACR Alumni Research Support Facility, which will be implemented in a 12 month period. So we started in September and will end August this year. ACR partnered with the University of New England to deliver the activities and provide academic mentoring. The COVID-19 defined, really defined our 2020. It exposed vulnerabilities in the food and agricultural systems, adversely affecting consumers, agriculture producers, and all other relevant chain actors. Consumers found difficulty in accessing needed safe and nutritious food, while agricultural producers had limited access to markets, which in turn affected their livelihoods. Other actors involved in the food and agricultural system, including the suppliers, consolidators and traders, and retailers also had to adapt to a situation where movement of people and goods were limited. This showed that resilience of the food and agricultural system of the Philippines has to be developed at, and this may be achieved through the introduction of policies related to food and agriculture. Women are one of the most vulnerable sectors of the society. FAO reported that around 25% of women were employed in agriculture sector in the Philippines in 2017. Adverse impacts in agriculture can also impact on the welfare of women. They also face the burden of ensuring that members of the household are consuming safe and nutritious food. This burden was exacerbated by the issues and concerns brought about by the COVID-19 pandemic. It is recognized that women are important to agriculture. So what are the current policies in place and what are the gaps? Well, how can local governments develop inclusive policies for women and their role in enhancing resilience of the food and agricultural systems? When a shark sent out the call for proposals to their alum alumni, my collaborator and fellow John Allwright alumni Luis Walda and I, and I thought of aligning the proposal with the theme food system resilience with focus on answering those questions. The main objective of this project is to develop a policy framework that can guide local government units in developing gender inclusive and responsive local policies. Specific objectives of this project are the following. First is to stock, to take stock of existing policies related to women in agriculture and food and nutrition security. And second, to determine barriers to developing agricultural policies that are inclusive to women. Third, to analyze local policymaking processes and determine opportunities for introducing gender responsive policies. And fourth, is to develop a framework for, develop, for formulating inclusive agriculture development and food and nutrition security policies. We have four expected outcomes. The first is a database of local policies or ordinances that promote welfare of women in agriculture development. This can enhance 
access to policies that may be adopted by local government units in the country and also assist academics and students. Next is identification of best practices in the country for pro promoting welfare of women in agriculture development and food and nutrition security. The, this can provide information on best examples that may be adopted or tailored to suit local situations. And third is a policy framework that can serve as a guide for local executive councils that can make local agriculture development policies more inclusive and responsive to the needs of women. A framework can support local government units in identifying priorities given their limited resources. And last is a guidebook that provides options for policies and initiatives for developing gender responsive and lo local agriculture development policies. It will make use of the developed uh, policy framework, but is expected to feature detailed learnings and examples from this project. The research area is in the province of uh, in um, Davao provin provinces. So the Davao region comprises six cities, which include the highly urbanized city of Davao, 43 municipalities, and around a thousand barangays or villages. The population as of 2015 was around 4.9 million. So the Davao region is located in the island of Mindanao in the Philippines. Female council members in Davao region are, the, are in the minor, minority. Out of the 420 councillors in the region, only 22% are women. It is almost the same with the vice mayors with 73% male and 27% female. Meanwhile, a third of the mayors in the Davao region are females. The preceding three slides confirm the food and agriculture organizations, country gender assessment of agriculture, in the rural sector in the Philippines report in 2018, which stated that although the country had made progress in advancing the status of women, the representation of women in decision making is still low. The males continue to dominate in local executive and legislative. In 2018, the FAO identified around seven agriculture and rural development laws, policies, and strategies relevant for gender equality and rural women's empowerment in agriculture. On our preliminary run of the 127 documents gathered, the most common ordinances that include women were in response to the Republic Act 9710 of the, or the Magna Carta for Women of Women in 2008. Meanwhile, the local ordinances were related um, the local ordinances on agriculture were related to the Organic Agriculture Act or RA10068. Some municipalities have local farmers code. As one of the project's objectives, we will build a repository of the laws and policies so that this may this will be accessible to the general public. This will also answer some difficulties in data gatherings especially with the limited mobility, communication structure, infrastructure, and other related issues. Ms. Jaya Manila, our research associate, will expound on this topic in, on her presentation. Since I already mentioned one of our research team, let me introduce you to the rest of the team. Mr. Luis Walda is an adjunct faculty of SOM and our collaborator. Ms. Jaya Manila is our research associate. Dr. Christy Chang is our mentor from the University of New England. All these have presentations in this webinar. If you have further questions about the project, you can send us an email. We also have a Twitter page, so you can like our page. And within the month, we will launch our website. It is still under construction. We will send you a link once it is ready and you can access a recording of this webinar through that page. Thank you very much for listening and good afternoon.
Thank you so much, Ms. Malu. Indeed, we have a very long way to go. So um, at this point, let us proceed to the lecture on gender studies in agriculture, agribusiness, examples from Papua New Guinea by Dr. Christy Chang. Dr. Christy Chang is an adjunct associate professor of the University of New England and is currently the ARSF project's mentor. She has years of experience in international development in the Asia and the Pacific as agribusiness value chain and marketing specialist and agricultural economist. In 2008, she was recognized by the Australian Research Council as an expert of international standing in agribusiness. And also since 2008, she had several projects on sweet potato value chain in Papua New Guinea, which are ASEAN funded. She will share examples of her work on gender studies in agribusiness and agriculture from this Pacific island. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Christy Chang. Let me just say hello to uh, the participants, but also uh, Professor Larry Beagle, which I know for many years. And I also like to say hello to uh, Bu uh, Nuro from Lombok, which I'm surprised to see uh, that she's also in the audience. Okay. So I'm very fortunate to be involved in several Asia projects. And one of them has been in, was in the Philippines and several years I spent in Papua New Guinea. And today I'm just going to share with you some experience that I have gained by uh, working in Papua New Guinea, sweet potato value chain. And this is a bit outline of my presentation, which uh, talk a little bit about what the Asia projects were involved in the main project activity and some results from the gender studies and the lessons learned. So Papua New Guinea is a very interesting place to work and the sweet potato is grown mainly up in the highlands. So we can see that Mount Hagen is the capital city of Western province and Boroka is the capital of the Eastern highlands. And sweet potato are grown in these highlands, but the main markets are on the coastal areas. So Lei, oh, sorry. So Leigh and Paul Mosby, they are very far from Highlands, but that's where the markets are. And Highlands um, are the main study area for this project. So I have the good fortune to have several sweet potato value chain project in PNG. And the main aim was to improve income and livelihood of smallholder farmers by improving in three main areas. One is marketing. The second area is post-harvest management and also try to improve uh, processing and value addition of sweet potato. And as always, these projects have a focus on value chain and social economics analysis and gender. Compared to previous projects or many projects, they are still ongoing. They are focused more on production and technical aspect. So our projects focus mainly on value chain and socioeconomic analysis. Gender is important in terms of value chain analysis in Papua New Guinea because sweet potato being traditionally a female crop. 
is grown by women and managed by women. Secondly, gender inequality is prevalent in communities in Sri Potato Valley chain. So we are trying to gain some insights into how women's income and livelihood can be improved by our work. So first of all, I would like to give you some background very briefly on uh, Papua New Guinea. So it's mainly Melanesian people, which it's less uh, common in the South Pacific because they are mostly Polynesian. In PNG, it's very diverse socially and culturally. And the records have shown that they have more than 800 languages and, diff and ethnic group. So you can see if gender is a social issue or social construct, then you know to deal with gender issues in PNG, you have to be very careful about you know, what the local conditions are. And it, PNG was colonized by the Germans, the Dutch, the British, and managed by Australia for many years. You know, from 1899 to 1975. Changes were uneven across PNG, which islands and coastal area colonized before the interior. And even now, some group are resisting change. In 2019, PNG was ranked 155 out of 189 countries for Human Development Index. Uh, published by uh, UNDP. And it's ranked 166 out of 189 countries for gender inequality index. So you can see, you know, human development uh, fares slightly better than uh, the gender adjusted index. In 2000, 20 PNG was ranked 127 out of 153 overall in terms of global gender gap ranking. It was ranked 152 out of 153 in political empowerment. So, so far there's no women in the parliament. And previously, Malu mentioned that you know twenty two percent of the mayors were uh, women, and in PNG only fifty percent of the women is in managerial position, and none in the parliament. So, since our work is in PNG Highland, and the Highlands are even more special than you know, PNG overall. So outsiders did not visit the highlands until 1930. And it's a patriarchal society. So in general terms, women have very low social status. And gender division of labor is quite uh, distinct, right? So especially in the, before the white context, men fight and participated in tribal warfare. And women grow sweet potato and raise pigs. So very, very strict uh, women uh, dealing only domestic matters and men deal with outside world. It's also a polygamous uh, society and with big men in our future, very important in terms of social status. If you want to get married, you need to pay bride price to the woman's family. And this bride price usually is contributed by the community, not by the man who is going to get married. Domestic violence, it's prevalent. And there's also sorcery belief. Just a few years back, there are several women 
caught and burned on the stick because they were built, accused of uh, practice sorcery um, and make men hurt or die in a car accident. So many, all these things put women's life in sometimes in danger, but also in a very difficult position. And I show you a few pictures. That's what I was, I saw on my first trip to the village. So you can see women on the front and there are many men looking quite relaxed. And this is also on the road. And this is women selling sweet potato and vegetables on the roadside. On one side of the road, this is what I saw. And on the other side, there are men also looking very, you know, happy and relaxed. And in terms of gender division in the sweet potato value chain, you can see on the top, then preparation is done by men, planting is done by women, weeding, tending for three or four months or could be up to eight months, it's by women, harvesting by women, packing transport business managers of farm, they are all men. In terms of marketing at the very bottom, local marketing in the local market is done by women who you saw in the pictures sitting by the roadside. Long distance marketing to Lay and Paul Mosby and wholesaling is done by men. So just a few pictures showing what the work is involved. So this men doing land preparation, women doing planting, harvesting, and this is also carrying sweet potato from the field back to the house for packing. I don't, I didn't measure the bag, but I thought it could be, you know, at least 15, 20 kilos. And then she could carry this all day for, you know, 500 meters or one kilometers. And this is what his, her husband would do, carry on the bag. And this is the sweet old bag after being packed by men and sent down to Lay or Paul Mosby. And this is retailing in a local market. And this is wholesaling in Paul Mosby Golden Market. So here, uh, what, we, uh, well, what we did uh, on gender study, we have held focus group discussion with women, done farm survey on household decision making and ask them for assessment, self-assessment of happiness, gender training, financial literacy training, marketing planning and gross margin analysis. We also did some, so these are capacity building activities. We also have done some development activities which include linking farmers to commercial bank. So help them assess the group to uh, group loans, bank accounts and mobile banking in the village. From our study, we have identified several gender specific issues in sweet potato value chain. The first one is sweet potato production and marketing is laborious for women and they feel they are doing too much. And it's also with low returns because of oversupply and low price in local markets. When men do long distance marketing in Lay and Paul Mosby, the profit seems to be higher. And they also told us that the market facility they are selling are very poor, sometimes without fresh water and without toilets. 
They also worry about their personal safety to the market, especially after the market coming home, because they could be attacked for you know various reasons. So violence against women, it's a very serious problem. Discrimination by other value chain players, more often than not, they've been offered lower price, higher fees, or even reject service. So they don't get, get uh, the service they need. They also said that they have limited access to exchanging services and business skill training. And remember before I mentioned that um, there's gender division of labor. So men deal with outside, but women stay at home. So they don't get to participate in activities outside the home. They also told us they are given too much work to do. Sweet potato production, marketing, care for their children, the old, the sick, and also household chores. chores. So they feel like there's an equal division of labor and lack of support from the male family members. They also told us the distribution of income, it's uneven. Because if men take the harvest to cities in Lay and Port Mosby, they don't always give the money or share the money with the women. But on the other hand, if women selling in the local market, they have to give the earnings to the husband. Otherwise, you know, they could face, you know, domestic violence in some cases. In our study, we also asked men and women about how happy or how satisfied they were with their life. And this is a comparison between male and female. But you can see even in a very difficult living condition, people are satisfied, you know, more or less, because you can see from one to 10, most people are between five and seven. But if you look at the blue color that represents male's response and red for female's response, you can see female is less happy than male. And if you look at the 10, which is also uh, surprising. Women are more, can be most happy than um, men. But on the other side, some women rank their happiness two out of 10 or three out of 10, means that they are quite unhappy. So what are the lessons learned? First of all, we found that addressing gender issue is difficult as it changes, it challenges traditional norms and values, especially if you working in PNG Highlands, you know, they have been living in a particular way for 40,000 years. And then you want to change them in after seven or 80 years, which it's quite um, unreasonable, I believe. So it, it's a difficult issue, but this, therefore it takes time and political will. But it, not just political, political will, but also what the locals think about gender inequality. So some people feel, you know, it, they've been living like this for a long time, but some people are very unhappy, especially if they experience domestic violence. So due to um, social and cultural diversity in PNG, to improve gender inequality, it requires a participatory approach to address local issues. They are most pressing for the local people rather than based on the latest theoretical development 
elsewhere, especially in the developed world. My last lesson learned that I presented today is that raising awareness and gender training are first steps rather than, for example, gender mainstreaming. They have been promoted for many, many years from the international development agencies. And Jeff has a new approach. I hope it's more locally appropriate than before. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Chan. It's really interesting how specific gender issues varies across culture and even geography. That's why it's really imperative to have more research and to add knowledge uh, on a more contextualized uh, gender and development for a more contextualized rather. So at this point in time, let's proceed to the next lecture uh, about conducting research during the time of COVID-19 pandemic. This will be delivered by Ms. Jaya Manila. She is the research associate of the ARSF 087 project. She is a product of the School of, Bus School of, Manage School of Management's BS Agric Agribusiness economics program and got her degree in 2019 where she graduated as cum laude. Prior to her employment in the project, she worked in a business processing outsourcing company. This is her first full-time research experience after her thesis and she will share her experiences on how to conduct research in time of COVID-19 pandemic. Ladies and gentlemen, Ms. Jaya Manila. Um, good afternoon. My topic is about conducting research during time of COVID-19 pandemic. Um, I will be talking about how once it conducting our research project, it will be very specific and short. The study was actually designed to be feasible during the pandemic. So first, let me talk about the nature of the study. This will include the objectives of the research, our respondents for the research, for the research and the methods used. We employ different methods to achieve uh, our objectives for the study. So our objective number one is to take stock of existing policies related to women in agriculture and food and nutrition security. So what we did is to collate the record <laughs> of our respondents are actually counselors, mainly the committee chairs on agriculture and women. Then after that, we send formal communication letters indicating what the project is all about and what we needed from them. So that's uh, what we needed from them are actually the local policies or ordinances currently in place or drafted. For our um, objective number two, uh, which is to determine barriers to developing agriculture policies that are inclusive to women. Um, and also for uh, objective number three, to analyze local policy making processes and determine opportunities for introducing gender responsive policies. Uh, what we did is to conduct key informant interviews online with the committee chairs on agriculture and women. This is in order for us to better understand what are the processes uh, done before they draft an ordinance, how it affects the community, and how was it implemented. Through this, it also aids us in creating the survey questionnaires for the study. The actually the project is still ongoing, so we still haven't yet reached um, objective number four, which is to develop a framework for formulating inclusive agriculture development and food and nutrition security policies. So um, how was it? What are the challenges encountered during uh, data gathering and how did we overcome this? So I have listed around seven challenges encountered. So first, um, the first one is that 
there is no single database of counselors in agriculture committee and women. Uh, actually, we thought uh, that there is a one-stop shop where we can get this information. However, since there is none, what we did was to contact each provinces, municipalities, and cities. This is going to be via, line, uh, via landline phone, uh, through emails, mobile phone, and Facebook Messenger, just to gather those necessary contact details of the counselors that uh, we needed for the study. We were also unable to collect um, local ordinances due to fees. We have not assumed that there is fees in accessing or getting public documents. We have not accounted this in the budget proposal. So to augment, we look for alternative sources. For example, downloading it online or through the counselor or asking it through the counselors who sponsor those local ordinances. Mm, sometimes we were also unable to collect ordinances due to lockdowns of um, local government offices, specifically Sangguni Ambayan. Uh, we cannot do uh, anything about the lockdowns. This is for the safety of the people. So we just wait for the lockdowns to be lifted. Um, also, because the because of the limited number of staffs allowed to work, most of them are working from home. They cannot really provide right away what we requested because uh, they also don't have soft copies for the local ordinances. Uh, and one of the biggest problems encountered is the intermittent or no internet connection at all. We were really having a hard time communicating due to this. Um, for example, even in the middle of our online interview for the key informant, um, the meeting just got cut off or we were uh, we just suddenly disappear in the middle of the interview. We were kicked out of Zoom or Google meetings. So we, we just wait for and then reschedule again, then contact them via mobile phone or landline. So this is really the one of the biggest problems encountered. And also, next, uh, majority of the LGU officials, the counselors, are not available due to COVID-19 related tasks. Um, they are really busy both with municipal and provincial meetings. And um, agreeing to be interviewed takes a lot of time for them. Uh, first, because they re they really need uh, to prepare necessary references based <coughs> questions we provided beforehand. Um, and also, in that case, we just wait and reschedule the appointment. Of course, there is also the constant follow-up in our side. Um, some of the counselors are also not responsive. This is maybe because they are not um, keen or not really using emails and there is no internet connection on their end. Uh, they are really busy due to pandemic. Um, others were also hesitant. Um, maybe that's because they don't know us. So what we did is we follow up or contact um, Sangguni and staff for updates and to help us get connected with the counselors and also for assurance that we are really uh, working from University of the Philippines, Mindanao. And um, also we sent registered mails to municipalities with intermittent signal connection, uh, which if, uh, even actually calling them or text, texting them is actually hard. Um, luckily, we were able to get replies through this. So for my last uh, last slide, there is also the limited responses from the counselors. Uh, the last quarter of 2020 and the first quarter of 2021, we got a hard time scheduling an interview with the counselors because of year-end reports and budgeting for the next year. 
we hope, so we actually hope that um, around next month, which is April, we will be able to, con to conduct more interviews and answers uh, and to receive answers for the survey questionnaires we sent online and via registered mail. So that actually ends my topic. And thank you very much for listening. Good afternoon. Thank you so much, Miss Jaya. Really doing research under the new normal is a pressing issue not uh, across uh, different disciplines. That's why uh, finding answers and the most effective ways of doing research is still a continuing uh, questions. And the answers really are not only uh, interesting, but so well, um, everybody's waiting for it. Anyway, at this point, let's uh, proceed with, the, with another lecture on building resilience in food systems. This will be delivered by Mr. Luis Anto Antonio Hualda, adjunct faculty from the School of Management. Luis is an adjunct faculty member and formerly an assistant professor of the School of Management of the University of the Philippines, Mindanao. He has qualifications in community development and urban and regional planning. His research and work interests are in the areas of food security, agriculture development and food systems planning. He was also involved in initiatives to promote neglected and underutilized species of crops and mountain agriculture development to address poverty, hunger, and malnutrition in Asia and the Pacific. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Luis Hualda. Thank you very much, Mitch for that uh, kind introduction. Uh, I would also like to welcome and thank all of the participants who has tuned in uh, to this uh, webinar. Uh, this afternoon, I will be talking about building resilience in food systems, which is actually quite a broad topic. I think I bit off more than I can chew here. But I will try to discuss it more and narrow it down uh, and relate it to COVID-19 and uh, uh, COVID-19 responses and uh, women, the role of women. So uh, the first thing that I would like to show in this uh, presentation is that this will be an attempt to answer the question in how do we build resilience in the agriculture and food system? But it's a broad and complex topic. And so that we would like to focus on the following uh, key point. So we would like to focus on COVID-19 and its impact on agriculture and food, COVID-19 response and building back better the agriculture and food system. And then we will uh, dwell into the potentials and role of women in building resilience and try to look or find ways on the process of building resilience at the local level. Later on, I will be highlighting why we would look at women and why we would look at building resilience at the local level. So in terms of the presentation, uh, this is uh, divided into the following themes. First would be about the COVID-19 situation, which uh, I think was already covered by Molu earlier. The brief introduction of the concepts of agriculture and food system, a brief introduction on the concept of resilience uh, in the agriculture and food system, and then we will talk about women in building resilience in the agriculture and food system. So when we look at COVID-19 and agriculture and food system, we all know that there, was, uh, there were adverse impacts that were experienced by consumers, farmers, other actors uh, when the COVID pandemic hit. Uh, I think in some countries, it's still experienced and up until now. So basically, when you look at the food system, you have a combination or link between production and consumption. But then when lockdowns were implemented, there were limited movements in terms of goods and people. So what happened then that people lost access to safe and nutritious food, and at the same time, uh, farmers and agriculture producers lost access to markets. So during that time, food security and nutrition were placed at risk, livelihoods were threatened, and among those affected are women and the elderly. So women were especially affected by the pandemic as they are also involved in ensuring household food security and nutrition. So it may be said that more often than not, it's the women, adult women in the household who are in charge in food preparation in most cases. 
So when the pandemic hit, it would become a problem for them where they would be able to source their food that they would put on the tables of their families. At the same time, they're also engaged in activities in terms of production and agriculture and food, also in marketing activities. So because of the pandemic, some of them also lost employment because of the implemented lockdowns. So what were the responses at the time uh, when we had this pandemic? So the government, private sector, and non-government organizations implemented some measures. Uh, these measures tried to restore the link between consumers and farmers. So in the Philippines, we have the Kadiwa, the Ikadiwa. Uh, these are programs of the government that tries to, that allows farmers to bring their uh, products closer to consumers. So this was present a long time ago, but it was highlighted during the time of the pandemic. So there were also a proliferation of online shopping uh, services uh, like the Ikadiwa, and also some of the private firms like San Miguel Corporation tried to move uh, their products closer to the consumers. Uh, in some cases, there are local governments that provided food packs. And also, uh, food access was enhanced by encouraging own food production. These are either through household and community gardens. Uh, the Department of Agriculture of the Philippines actually tried to distribute seeds so that households have, uh, who are in lockdown uh, try to grow their own food. Well, to an extent, uh, these measures actually restored the function of the agriculture and food system, but it, this still does have some limitations. Say, for example, if you would try to promote online delivery services, not everyone still has access to mobile phone services or internet or in digital payment systems, especially when penetration of internet connectivity is only around 60%. So uh, there are still some things that has to be done to improve the responses to COVID-19. So what, do we, what did we learn from the COVID-19 pandemic? So it brought challenges that threaten food security and livelihoods of farmers and those involved in the agriculture and food system. So not only farmers, but also those who are doing marketing activities, food processors, and other actors who try to create value in, in food. So the COVID-19 exposed vulnerabilities of the agriculture and food system, but it also provided an opportunity to identify areas that need strengthening. So when we build back better the agriculture and food system, we can already identify, identify specific or challenges that has to be addressed. So COVID-19 was a realization that the agriculture and food system was fragile and vulnerable. But this has been going on for a very long time. It was only waiting for some triggers or disturbances that would expose those vulnerabilities. And women are greatly affected by the COVID-19 because they take care of food and nutrition in their households. And also they have, they were also impacted uh, when they lost employment during COVID-19. So when we say the food system, uh, there are many definitions to what a food system is. So it encompasses the entire range of actors and their interlinked value adding activities involved in the production, aggregation, processing, distribution, consumption, and disposal of food products that originate from agriculture forestry and fisheries, and parts of the broader economic, societal, and natural environments in which they are embedded. So food system actually transcends. It's, it goes above value chains. It goes above food supply and distribution systems because we would look at the societal and natural environments that are involved in it. So when we talk about agriculture and food as a system, mm -hmm. we have to identify its function. Now, there are still debates as to what exactly is the function of the agriculture and food system. But for this presentation, we would like to highlight that its function is actually to provide food security consumers or the population and livelihoods to agriculture producers who are engaged in it in a sustainable manner. When we talk about food security, the definition still hasn't changed for quite a number of years. But it's still about having all people, when all people at all times have physical, economic, and social access to sufficient, safe, and nutritious food to meet their dietary needs and food, food preferences for an active, healthy life. Now, COVID pandemic actually tried to disrupt that function 
uh, in terms of achieving food security because we lost our physical, economic, and social access to sufficient food. Say, for example, now, I think Metro Manila in the Philippines is actually experiencing some of the food price spikes, particularly in pork, because there is a shortage in pork. And one of the causes can be African uh, swine fever, but also at the same time, not, too, not much supply is actually going into Metro Manila. So when we look at uh, the vulnerability of the food system, these are about disturbances. Now, uh, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, it has been going on for a long time now in terms of the fragility of the food system. Because for the past three years, well, and for three years in 2017, 18 and 19, uh, the SOFI or State of Food Insecurity Report of FAO is actually talking about resilience. In 2017, it's about, it's about peace for food security in 2018, I think it's about climate change and resilience. And for 2019, it's about economic downturns, slowdowns and downturns. So we have been aware that something like this might happen, but it's what, it was only during COVID-19 that it was actually uh, highlighted or shall we say amplified. Now, the agriculture and food system has been vulnerable because we depend on a few crops rice, wheat, and corn. And I think for around 10,000 edible crop species, we only consume about seven for a maximum. So there are dominant uh, crop species that we eat. Food production is becoming specialized. So now we are having distant food production. Say for example, in the Philippines, we have established uh, vegetable growing areas wherein we have to, most of the municipalities actually source from these vegetable producing areas. Like in Mindanao, we have Northern Mindanao region uh, particularly Bukidnon and uh, Claveria. Also in Davao region, we have Kapatagan as a major producing area. So most of the food coming to the lowland areas come from these highland areas. Now, when you cut off that supply uh, because of lockdowns, there is a chance that uh, municipalities that are dependent on these uh, producing areas would lose their food supply. Another one is changing consumer preferences. So we prefer now more for convenient food and access to off-season food. Climate change, uh, rising temperatures, early or late onset of rainy seasons, shorter, shorter monsoon seasons with heavier rains, etc. Loss of biodiversity and conflict. Uh, say, for example, in Mindanao, I think particularly in Davao region, uh, once it was, we experienced typhoons around once every 26 years. So we have uh, considered it a typhoon-free region, but I think for the past five years or now, there are more um, typhoons coming in, at least signal number one. So we would like to build uh, resilience in the food system, but it would re actually require transformation in the agriculture and food system. So this is just a sort of a brief or very basic uh, representation of the agriculture and food system. So when we say, when we look at consumption, uh, we usually have a, we receive products from production. It goes through post harvest and processing and marketing and then distribution before consumption. But most of the time there's a feedback uh, between product and information. So whatever the consumer wants, it's usually what gets produced uh, by the producers. And it's that uh, consumer preferences that I think actually drives or changes uh, the agriculture and food system. And this is act happening actually globally. So uh, I will just look at the brief uh, description of the concept of building resilience or food system resilience. So one of the accepted, uh, widely accepted definition of food system resilience is the capacity over time of a food system and its units at multiple levels to provide sufficient, appropriate, accessible food to all in the face of various and unforeseen disturbances. Say, so for example, now uh, COVID-19 was an unforeseen disturbance. So it, it dislodged the function of the system. So. Resilience can be broken down into components of robustness in terms of capacity of the system to withstand disturbances, absorption, uh, redundancy in the system, wherein uh, the system can cope immediately uh, in terms of finding alternative sources uh, for its uh, uh, 
for it, for it to maintain its function and flexibility or rapidity, which is time to recover and resourcefulness or finding or developing alternatives. So in the case of the food system, actions were trying to, when they tried to restore the function of the food system uh, when the pandemic hit, we tried to look for developing links uh, between the uh, consumers and the producers. Uh, when the speed of time when that change happened, that is about flexibility. But in this case, uh, I would like to highlight more on the absorption capacity of the food system, which is when you have a disturbance in the system, you will not get affected immediately. So when we look at building resilience in the food and agriculture system, it's actually a nonlinear and complex process. There are several entry points uh, that can be done. When you try to improve the absorption capacity of the food system, you can try to localize food supply, implement agriculture diversification. You can also strengthen trade linkages with other uh, municipalities or promote indigenous food systems. But at the same time, there are also externalities that can be expected. When you try to, because it's a complex process, so when you try to promote own food production, it may reduce the opportunities for local farmers to earn. But when you also look at building resilience, it has to be uh, context-based. So there is no best solution, but it's more of trying to look for the best fit in every context. So backyard gardening uh, was encouraged by the Department of Agriculture, and it is one good case of trying to improve the local food supply but it may not be an option for densely populated areas. So we can build resilience at multiple levels like national, local, community, and household level. And the fo focus here is on enhancing the buffer capacity of agriculture and food. Now I would like to highlight now the local, community, and household level. So we can try to, as mentioned earlier, we can try to localize food production uh, by encouraging local production and utilizing idle assets, establishment of community gardens, household food production. And one thing, we can also try to diversify diets and food production. So diversification of diets and food production is not just about food supply, but it's also more about having that diverse or other sources of nutrients. And food preservation and processing. So if you cut off supply, at least you have some food available in your households or even in stores. Now, uh, the FAO conducted a survey before of the role of local production in building more resilient local food systems. This was done in last year, and Davao was actually featured in one of these responses. So they have a buyback program wherein they bought products from local farmers and then sent it to uh, as a supply to households who have no access to food. So there are actually a lot of shall we say, examples or good practices that were brought uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. But the thing here is now is that it should be institutionalized, I think, uh, that this should be not just during the pandemic, but should be a program that would be ongoing, that when in case a, another unforeseen disturbance is uh, experienced, there's still a continuation of food supply. So, uh, when we try to build resilience, we can look at the food system as a dynamic system. It constantly changes. If you impact on one aspect of it or one node, it would create change. Now, as I have mentioned earlier, uh, it seems that the global food system, even local food systems, are influenced by consumer preferences. Now, in the case of trying to build resilience, we can start by looking at behavior change at the consumption end. So we can try to look at probably looking at diversifying food sources. Uh, we can prefer local food instead of food that is brought outside. At least we can have some food available if ever lockdowns are implemented. We can also look at consuming our own food, preparing food or preserving food. Now in this case, uh, I've mentioned before that we are look, talking about the role of women. Now, women can be considered 
or identified as the catalysts for this to happen because they can introduce changes, behavior changes at the household level and also guide production. So also even at the marketing and distribution stage, they can introduce because they're also, they're all, women are involved in almost all stages of the food uh, system. So they can also inform consumers during the marketing stage. They can introduce processing at post-harvest. They can introduce home gardening. But the key thing here, I think, is more on, we try to look at behavior changes at the consumption stage and allow women to be that catalyst. Now, I am trying to highlight the role of women uh, in this initiating this change, but enhancing the role of women does not necessarily mean increasing their burdens. What we would try to do is as much as possible, reduce the burden of women, even if we are expecting them to be the catalyst of this change. So what this needs is that uh, we can call it an enabling, enabling environment. So it can have dimensions of socioeconomic, technical, institutional, and the policy side. So sexual, uh, socioeconomic would be the meaningful participation in decision-making processes, great, uh, greater control and access over assets and resources. Technical would be introduction of labor-saving technology, availability and access to gender-responsive technology. Uh, institutional would be changing perceptions and gender roles within organizations. And uh, the most thing that is related to us in this project is more about the gender-sensitive policies in agriculture development. So what we have experienced now is that when we look at the local policies related to agriculture and women in development, these are gen uh, generally gender blind. We have, uh, we talk about developing the agriculture sector, but we are not dissecting it to the extent of how women and men may be able to contribute. Even if technologies are developed, uh, these may not be uh, tuned in or appropriate for the role of women. One example that I experienced before uh, in terms of labor saving technology in Nepal, uh, feminization of the agriculture sector is very high because most of the male would actually go outside of the country to work in overseas or in cities because they, it gives them more stable economic employment. Uh, the Department of Agriculture equivalent there, they tried to develop single picking varieties for mung beans so because it's the women who are left at the farm, they tried to develop or develop new varieties that would save, the, uh, save labor and make work easier for women. So that's, that's, those are the types of technology that has to be developed. So now I'm also in talking about why do we need to institute changes at the local level? Uh, the I think the importance of local government units in developing changes in the agriculture and food sector started around 2015. Uh, there were talks about that. And then in 2017, uh, the UN Habitat uh, New Urban Agenda actually tried to look into food systems and the role of planning. So why local governments? Because it's through local government that policy and design and implementation can be implemented quite quicker. It's closer to the constituents, um, more responsive to their needs. And they have functions in agriculture, education, health, enterprise development, cooperative development, and women development. So there is a sort of autonomy among local governments that can be quickly implemented compared to um, relying on national laws. So it's that autonomy of local governments that's what's in, what is important and also monitoring and evaluation can be implemented locally. So key points uh, that I would like to highlight in this presentation that COVID-19 disrupted the function of the agriculture and food system. The responses attempted to restore the function of the system and we would try to build back better the agriculture and food system by institutionalizing responses and transforming agriculture and food systems. And the catalyst for building resilience is through changing consumer preferences, which can be led by women. But at the same time, we should empower women and not add to their burden as their roles in the agriculture food system are enhanced. And building resilience in the agriculture and food system can begin at the local level 
because of greater control over policies and resources at this level. So thank you very much uh, uh, for listening to my presentation. Okay, thank you so much.